Hey everybody, Christopher Odd here, and this video is the first in a series of videos I'm going to be sharing about my time with XCOM 2 recently. First of all, I just want to thank 2K for inviting me to the hands-on event. I had such a great time and I met a lot of really great people. Had a blast. Today's video is really going to focus on soldier promotions, uh, some base management, and then obviously I'm going to show you a gameplay mission. Uh, it's a guerrilla ops mission that I think you're going to enjoy. Uh, throughout the small series of videos that I have planned, I'm going to go in depth on the character customization options. I'm going to share my thoughts on some of the new mechanics. And I'm going to try to share as much information as I can from my experience with the game hands-on. If there's anything that you think that I may have missed or if there's anything you want more info on, uh, just let me know in the comments. I'll be pretty active in replying there. Or if you want to message me on Twitter, that's completely fine as well. Uh, I'll try to answer whatever I possibly can for you guys. I did also have the pleasure of speaking with Jake Solomon. He's the creative director from XCOM 2, and I recorded a short interview with him. Over the course of the videos, I'll be sharing some snippets in the appropriate scenarios from uh, some of the explanations that he had for different mechanics and ideas for XCOM 2. So uh, hopefully you guys enjoy, and uh, let's just get started here. So as you can already tell, the promotions have been revamped a little bit. One of the nice things, specifically about the sharpshooter class, is that at the squaddy rank, you actually get squad sight unlocked automatically. So it's no longer a choice between snapshot and squad sight. Squad sight happens right away. Uh, the next two promotions that we have available and that had been chosen for us before the demo were uh, Long Watch versus Return Fire. Long Watch allows uh, Overwatch to trigger with Squad Sight, pretty powerful. And then Return Fire, which I kind of undervalued at first, but it ended up helping me quite a bit, is when you're targeted by enemy fire, you're automatically gonna fire back with your pistol once per turn. Whether your pistol's equipped or not, that doesn't matter as a sharpshooter. So it's actually pretty cool and it came in handy quite often. And the second decision at the sergeant level was between Deadeye, which is taking a shot with a small aim penalty for significant damage boost, so kind of like the headshot from XCOM, uh, versus Lightning Hand, which is pretty interesting as well. You fire a pistol at a target, but it doesn't cost an action. So it's pretty cool. You can do this once per turn. You essentially get a free shot with your pistol, and then you can also shoot your rifle can be pretty powerful and you can tell that this is under the gunslinger part of the tree and these are the options that were chosen for us for this class already. Next up we have our specialist class and this is kind of your support class from if you need a comparison to the original XCOM and uh, at squatty rank it unlocks the aid protocol which is essentially a defensive boost to a nearby ally. Um, can get you out of some tough situations. Cool thing about this class is that it employs the use of a gremlin, it's called. And essentially it's just this drone that follows you around and you can kind of send it out to execute some of your abilities. So some of these abilities, uh, firstly, we've got the medical protocol. This is just your basic healing ability. You send out your gremlin uh, and it heals your allies. Combat protocol is for more of an offensive type of build and it does electrical damage, so really good against robotic enemies. One of the things you'll notice is that I think the descriptions are vastly improved in XCOM 2. Uh, it gives you a lot clearer indication of what not only abilities do, but items as well. Uh, the next two abilities are uh, Revival Protocol. It works just like you might think, uh, but with the added benefits of removing things like disorientation, stuns, and panic. And then last but not least, we have the Haywire Protocol. And honestly, it sounds too cool not to try out, so that was a skill that I chose for this demo. And you can definitely see some synergies happening between certain skills already. And uh, it'll be really interesting to see, once all of the skills are finally revealed, uh, how people choose to build these classes out, because I think we've got some pretty good options already. And the last class upgrade that I'm going to go through for this video is going to be related to the Ranger class. This is the sword wielding class that is now part of XCOM 2. Uh, you unlock Slash at Squatty, which is basically attacking any enemy within movement range of your sword. What's kind of intriguing about this ability is it includes being able to slash after a dash. So it's not a slash per uh, movement point, it's after your entire movement phase 
even if you have to dash, you can use the slash. That could be pretty powerful, and you can cover a lot of ground to do some damage. Now, first up, we have the Phantom skill for more of a quote-unquote stealth approach. Uh, or we have Blade Master for extra damage on your sword attacks. I actually chose Blade Master for the demo, but honestly, as I get more comfortable with concealment, I think I would definitely consider using Phantom. And the reason why is it just lets you have some extra mobility during the concealment phase. You're able to, able to cover a lot of ground, and being able to have a soldier maneuver the battlefield while everybody else is in position could open up some interesting possibilities for flanking or for numerous other strategic advantages that you can think of. One of the next areas to check out is going to be the weapon upgrade customization. I'm going to go into this in a lot more detail in future episodes. Uh, but the interesting thing here is the actual upgrades and attachments themselves. You can see that each of them have some bonuses, uh, whether it be aim or bonus action chances, or some of them even have instantaneous kills, which is pretty cool. The chances are minimal, like an instant kill chance of 5%. Okay. Uh, aim increase of plus five. That's pretty good. It's a permanent increase. Clip size, as you can see here, is pretty invaluable on our Grenadier class for obvious reasons. Uh, the thing is, is you could truly spend hours, and I almost did this at the event. <laughs> you could truly spend hours just customizing your loadout, customizing your, obviously, your character, your weapons. It's just seemingly like the possibilities are endless. Now, another cool addition is this mechanic called Personal Combat Sims. And essentially what it is, it's permanent upgrades that you can make to your soldiers uh, that will increase a certain aspect of that soldier. Be it mobility, be it health, be it aim. Anything that you can manipulate can be manipulated through Personal Combat Sims. Now, the upgrades are permanent. And once you use a PCS, it is gone forever. You can overwrite a PCS with another upgrade, but then the original one is gone. I'm not sure on how frequent you're going to be able, or how frequently you're going to be able to do this, but uh, it seems like it's plentiful enough where it's not going to be the end of the world if you end up overwriting a previous decision that you've made for any of your soldiers. Now, you're about to see that I end up actually equipping the Advanced Speed PCS on my Sniper, but truthfully, if I could do it over, I'd probably choose my Ranger to combo nicely with the Slash and Blade Master skills. Uh, I didn't know early on that you'd be able to dash and still slash with your sword, so being able to have an extra two tiles for that ability is incredible. Our next stop is going to be at the Engineering Bay, and you'll notice that there are some pretty traditional items that work as anticipated. Uh, but I did notice something interesting regarding the med kit. Pay attention to the item description of the med kit here, and you'll notice it removes a variety of adverse conditions, including burns and poison. Yeah, burns. So, <laughs> I'm not sure what's going to burn us out there. It's not going to kill us instantly and be a lasting effect. And I'm not sure how burning is going to impact us, but it's not going to be good. Okay, so the next stop is the Guerrilla Tactics School. This includes an area called New Combat Tactics. And this is essentially a replacement to the Officer Training School. It has some similar upgrades, as you can see, but also a lot of new tactics that are involved. Uh, first and most obvious choice is squad size 1, and the available upgrades at the time of this demo were Vulture and Lightning Strike. I do wish that I could have looked through the other potential upgrades a little bit more, uh, but you can probably make some fairly close guesses just based on the names that you see. And actually, uh, since you're here anyways, why not take a guess at what you think some of these tactics are? I'd be really interested to hear if you could guess them just based on the name. I'm pretty sure that you guys can figure out some of them. but. Uh yeah, that would be interesting. I'd love to hear your opinions. Now, the last thing to point out is the button at the very top of the Guerrilla Tactics School. And this is revolutionary <laughs> from an XCOM perspective. So think about those times when you've had a squad that's full of, like, seven assaults, one support, and a heavy with no sniper. 
that's happened to me a few times that I can remember. And this button is going to be a godsend if that's something that frustrates you. Basically what you can do is you can train a rookie as a specific class. And it's only a small investment of supplies and time to be able to have them graduate to the class that you want. But wow, can that ever help you out immensely when you're just not getting the random draws that you need. Now I am going to do a, some minor squad customization and then I'm going to be ready to head out on the first mission. Uh, for the purpose of this demo, they gave us some very specific save files to load up and specific missions that we could go on. You're probably wondering why I'm not going to the research lab though, even though the exclamation point is clearly asking me to go there. Uh, we were given pretty specific instructions not to go into the research lab. Not just to not show anything from the research lab, but just don't go to the research lab. So my guess is that it's either A, it hasn't been completely finalized, or B, they have a plan to reveal some of the crazy research projects that might be in there in the very near future. Uh, my gut is that it's probably a little bit of both. And uh, by the way, the customization that you're seeing here, I'm gonna go into in a lot more detail in uh, a future video. Like, I said this earlier about the guns, but you can spend hours customizing characters. Hours. And I'll probably be doing that because you get pretty attached to these guys, so it's cool that we can set up as much flexibility as we want. Now we're gonna access the Hologlobe and we'll see kind of the overview of the map. Things are quite a bit different than the previous Situation Room. There's gonna be things on here that you probably don't understand. Uh, the most important one that I would say is something at the very top there called Dark Events. And Dark Events are related to the alien win condition. So yes, aliens can actually win too and it's kind of a race between you guys and the aliens. Uh, so certain missions like this one will be able to counter events that the aliens are working on. I think it'll be best to hear it from Jake Solomon himself, and I'll use this opportunity to play a clip from my discussion with him, where he explains how the alien win condition impacts our attempt to win. What we wanted was a mechanic where the player was in a bit of a race towards the end of the game, and they had elements of pressure. And so, you know, if you think back to XCOM Enemy Unknown, if the player played the right way, there really wasn't as much pressure because let's say they put satellites everywhere, then they could basically eliminate pressure. And we wanted to change that. We wanted it to be, uh, give the player a sense that since they weren't in control, that the aliens were racing for their own win condition. And so the way that works is that, you know, early on in the game, the players are gonna make it, the, the aliens are gonna make it clear that they're working towards a win condition. And they have a couple of different things they can do to, um, to advance that wind condition. They could do dark events or they can build facilities around the world that speed up path towards their victory condition. And so the player just has to sort of weigh that against the things they're doing. So the player has certain things they need to do uh, to advance XCOM and to advance the story. And at the same time, they have to weigh that against, oh, should I be paying attention to what the aliens are doing? Should I slow them down? And, and so that, that, that's how it kind of works mechanically. So at this point, we're ready to head out on our first mission here of the demo. This is Operation Warhand. It's a guerrilla ops mission. We're going to have to recover some atmospheric analysis. So run here, grab that, and we should be good. However, we know that it's not going to be a walk in the park. This is Avenger. The access point we're after is just ahead. Move to secure the area. Expect hostile resistance. During the gameplay, I probably won't talk the Our entire time. Sealed. I'll try to explain things as it's coming, and then I'll let you guys just kind of enjoy as much as I can. Uh, I'm going over the skills here. We have some mech-like qualities on our Grenadier. We have Demolition, which destroys or damages cover. And then we can actually launch uh, grenades as well, which is pretty cool. Our Gremlin here is our support class, as we talked about earlier. Aid Protocol goes and provides additional defense. Uh, the Gremlin Heal is essentially like a med kit, and you can do this remotely, so you can send it out to heal people that are further away. Stabilize does what you would imagine. Next up, we have the Ranger class. This is our slash ability with the sword. And then last but not least, our sniper. There's a couple of cool, like, polished changes. Pistol on Overwatch is amazing, so you just don't have to switch your weapon. Uh, Lightning Hands is something we picked up at the uh, Guerrilla Tactics School, where we can fire a pistol without having to use an action point on a turn. It's pretty significant, and uh, 
yeah, I, I think we're, we're going to make good use of that in the future. So there are a few other things to note here before we dive too deep into the mission. Uh, the most obvious one is that we're in the concealment phase, and this allows us to finally Move get the jump on the aliens instead of vice versa. Uh, what's cool about this is we have pretty much free range to move anywhere we want, unless we step into a tile that would reveal us. Now these tiles are indicated by these red uh, tiles with, I believe it's a little eye on them, we'll be able to see on the left and the right here because there's some sentry towers. The sentry towers are not uh, offensive by any means, they are uh, defensive and only used for scanning. So you can see some of them there. And if you walk into that, the concealment phase is over and you will have to proceed as normal. So it's pretty interesting. Uh, the other thing that you'll notice is that we have a countdown timer happening in the top right. This is the amount of turns until you must finish the mission. This is not a new concept, but from my understanding, this is a lot more prevalent in XCOM 2. So that combined with what Jake was saying about the alien win condition is pretty scary. It's going to be a lot of pressure. It's going to really encourage people to keep moving and not just rely on a lot of overwatch. Something I'm going to have to work on myself, and I'm sure uh, a lot of people have to do as well. But uh, it's pretty... Uh, I like the fact that it's going to make things more difficult. And uh, speaking Stay of low. difficulty, actually, uh, I was asking Jake what, you know, how they balance that. Is it purely just the um, strength of the enemy or... Is it just our chance to hit is reduced? And I'll actually just play another clip of how he explained it. it you know, it's one of these things that as a designer, you're, you, I think your first in instinct is to change a lot of things for difficulty level. Right. The problem is when you turn that, you know, I, I say this all the time, we talk about this all the time on the team, like never turn two knobs, right? Because <laughs> if you turn two knobs, then you don't know which knob got you the result. Yeah. And so you have to be really patient. And when you're, when you're designing and balancing, you have to turn one knob and say, did I get close to the result I want? And the problem is, of course, you don't have all the time in the world to like just turn one knob. And so sometimes you get a little antsy and you start tweaking a bunch of things and then you go play and you're like, ah, shit, that's all messed up now. And then you don't know what it is that you broke. So, I mean, you try to be careful with how many things you tie to the difficulty level. But I mean, obviously making the enemies tougher is one thing, but you know, even on the enemies, there are many, many, many knobs to turn. What you try and do is keep the um, the missions themselves. You try to keep them as similar as you can between difficulty levels because you're going to get more enemies and tougher enemies as the difficulty levels increase. And then automatically, just turning those knobs turns a couple of other knobs automatically. Like right. Now the timers don't change. And that becomes much more difficult because now there's harder enemies and more of them between you and your objective. And so, um, well, I mean, it doesn't, I mean, I say this like we know what the fuck we're doing, but <laughs> we have, we have a lot of cases where like, I still, I still find myself turning multiple knobs and then all of a sudden the mission goes from, oh, that's too easy to, that's impossible. Yeah. And it's, be, and it, it's always, and then I always am like, you know what? I turned like three knobs at once and and you just get these like you hit these walls and so it is something that that combined with how unpredictable XCOM 2 is it really you have to be careful and and, I, and again I, I say that not because I'm so smart and I know that it's because I've been dumb so many times that you know we, we had towards the end we learned like we have to be pretty careful with with what we change per difficulty level so you'll notice, uh, we now have some enemies on the battlefield, we have an advent mech, and we have an advent soldier. One of the greatest things about this concealment phase is we can set up an ambush. And the way to do that is we want to set some of our guys on overwatch, and then we will attack uh, with one of our soldiers. And what this will do is it'll cause the enemy to kind of freak out that we're going to run around. And of course, if everything goes according to plan, we can kill them with overwatch shots. Uh, you'll also notice that the enemies will patrol, they will move around. And so those, those um, revealing squares 
will move and can move towards you, so you're not totally safe in concealment. Let's see how our ambush works out. So, yeah, it went pretty well. Uh, one thing to note, like, this was my first time hands-on in a mission that wasn't a tutorial. And so to, to set up the very first time, execute a successful ambush, I was like, okay, this is going to be, this is great. And then I realized, I was like, oh, yeah, but we're on the default difficulty setting. And I don't think things are going to go that smoothly every time. But uh, it was a pretty cool feeling to, to finally get in there and uh, set that up like that and have it execute just perfectly. Um, one thing to note, you'll notice that the, uh, the mech had uh, armor that we ended up damaging a little bit. And so that'll reduce the damage that you can do. These creatures once operating under the guise of thin men now show their true form. A purely reptilian species. Purely reptilian species. The aliens don't need an infiltration unit anymore. Now, I'll give you a little bit of a spoiler here. Uh, we're not going to get to to see any of the Viper attacks on this time because of the way that things pan out in a second here. But uh, just because I think it's a really cool reveal, I'm going to go back and show you that again. Uh, and just take a look at the detail of this enemy. It's pretty. Uh, it's pretty exceptional. I'm just personally very happy that Thin Men are no longer around. Uh, they're replaced by the Viper, which, as you'll see in a future mission, and I, I will show you this, they are devastating. And they have some pretty unique abilities that are actually game-changing. It's, uh, it's actually pretty scary. So at this point, what's going through my head is, A, don't screw this up, because there's a lot of people watching, and... B, don't screw this up because there's a lot of people watching. So I'm just trying to figure out, like, how am I going to deal with this enemy that I've never seen before? And uh, this actually prompted one of the questions that I asked Jake about uh, a comparison from the first XCOM, or I shouldn't say the first, but XCOM Enemy Unknown. And you were able to highlight an enemy and hit the F1 key to see, like, an info panel of its abilities. We don't have that anymore. And uh, I'll actually share with you what he said about that, because uh, I think it's I think it's pretty uh, interesting, his take on it. Nowadays, yeah, I mean, they, so the one way to do it, of course, is if you, um, if you hack the robotic enemies, you get complete access to all their information. Right. But, you know, it, it's, a, it's an interesting question, because... We did have that. We did have that. And, and um, on the team, we called it German mode because our German fans are very, you know, like they're awesome strategy players. And so they're very much into the detail. And right. so um, we did have that, but now we don't. And it's sort of, I guess, from my standpoint, it's a bit experiment to see, okay, you know, if we give the aliens some sense of mystery then they feel more like an actual opponent as opposed to just a sort of a cardboard cut out of an opponent and so i don't know if that's right or not but it's something that i think i've swung the opposite direction of eu where we did give you sort of all of that information about the enemy um now we're kind of holding on to it and we're sort of allowing the enemies to have some mystery um, and we want it to be, we really want the player to have that experience in combat where, yeah, well, she'll go and grab you. And a lot of our other enemies have lots of cool abilities. And so I really want the player to have those experiences in combat. Um, and that sort of be like your experience with the enemy is what sort of teaches you about, about them. Yeah, and it is, it is a cool approach. Like even, you know, when you run into the Viper thing and you, and, you know, you've been pretty vocal about that, that specific enemy type in the past. Um, but when it happens for the first time where it just yanks you right up front and you're like, holy shit, 
Like, as a player, you're like, that's awesome. But as, like, somebody who cares about their soldiers living and dying, you're like, fuck, that's terrible. Uh, like, I think, <laughs> I, I think it is cool that it's like, there's a lot of, there's gonna be a lot of surprises, and when you encounter a new enemy type, you're kind of like, I don't know what this thing's gonna do, so brace yourself, you know? That's, that's right. pretty interesting. Yeah, and that, and I think that's the feeling we want, and, and even when, and the abilities are, you know, I think we, um, balance is really, balance is very important, but we view it from the angle of, we really want to, before we even worry about balance, we worry about, uh, you know, we talk about sort of like the, we want these things to be grand, we want these abilities to have impact, right. and we want the player, when they encounter them, even if you do know what they can do, we really want these things to be able to sort of turn combat, and so everything's going fine, and then a sequence of unfortunate events occurs, and now the player is kind of fighting for their life, and that's really what we we wanted. And I think that in in um and, and it's a little something we learned is that players once they learned XCOM, and th this will always be the case to some extent, but in Enemy Unknown, players could pretty much control the AI, and they could you know their, their yeah. inputs always granted the same outputs, and that's a problem because that'll give the player a sort of a very samey experience from mission to mission and from game to game. And so we wanted to, to give the aliens the ability to continue to surprise the player and every once in a while turn combat in the aliens' favor. Even if you kind of know what you're doing, it, it still happens where things can line up in a certain way where you get surprised. And I think that's when, I think XCOM's at its best when it is sort of surprising you and, and giving you at least, you know, it, I think games nowadays have to generate content and I, by content I just mean they have to generate stories they have to you have to have experiences that you can go to somebody and say oh well this neat thing happened let me tell you about it and the player's like oh yeah I didn't have that experience and so that's neat for me to listen to that story and now let me share something with you and and certainly I mean somebody in your position knows for sure that if games can't generate content in terms of interesting stories or interesting experiences then it's more difficult than I think today's age. And so I, I really think it is important for games to be able to generate sort of interesting stories and content for the people who play them. So you may have also noticed that there was uh, some yellow icons on the screen and there was like a hand over top of them. These are supplies that you can pick up. And the way you pick them up, you can't just run through the square. You actually have to make a stop in the square. So you don't have to end your turn there. Uh, but your first move has to end in there, or your second move has to end in there for you to get those items. Now, the amount of shots that we're hitting, uh, it doesn't surprise me too much, just based on our soldier ranks and the difficulty being set at the default. When I normally play on Impossible, I can't expect to have results like this. And that being said, in the in the next mission that I'm going to show you guys in a separate Moving. video, even on this difficulty setting, Object things here. got pretty dicey. Commander, we have confirmation of the exposed access point. There we have it. This is the big new sectoid reveal, and as you can see, he's significantly more imposing than his previous brethren were. But uh, I'll be quiet for a bit here so you guys can just kind of see and hear what's happening for uh, the last part of the mission.
Target neutralized. Positive confirmation. So at this point, we're going to try to move in and hack this thing. It'll uh, give me an opportunity to kind of explain the hacking system. If I were to describe it in a comparative manner, it's going to sound strange, uh, but you'll know what I mean in a second. I would compare it to like the air warfare of enemy unknown and enemy within. That might sound strange, but uh, I'll show you in a second here when it comes up. Cool thing is with the gremlin, like we can hack remotely. We don't actually have to be up there in order to uh, to do it. So once we select the appropriate character, then uh, we're gonna initiate the hack. The gremlin actually has pretty huge implications. Um, being able to hack remotely, heal remotely, uh, it can keep our soldier initiating the hack safe while saving another or opening a door a that look. could give us another vantage point or hacking an enemy. This is the hacking screen here and, and how it works. I'll start in the top left. This is your overall hacking percentage. This one, uh, the hack to breach the network is guaranteed at 100 because it's a mission critical objective. Uh, you get to choose a hacking reward, both uh, with varying degrees of success. These two specific ones just happen to impact the strategy layer back at the base. Uh, but if you're hacking an enemy mech, as an example, you will be able to choose to shut down the mech or to control the mech. And both of those have dis different uh, chances to succeed. And then you'll also notice that there's a uh, potential to fail. And those can range from giving the enemy more armor, more movement speed, to making them uh, more powerful uh, from a damage perspective. So, yeah, it's it's pretty it's a pretty interesting system. The reason I compare it to the air warfare is it's it's just strictly uh, chance based, and there is like a tech score at the bottom that will determine your odds of success, and that's something that you can develop on your soldier if necessary so uh the hack was successful and the mission was complete this is another very cool uh screen that's in place we have the kind of final tally of all the enemies that we killed it gives you a rating for your mission and then we also have these stats so successful sop shot percentage average damage per attack average enemies killed per turn average cover bonus and then whoever dealt the most damage made the most attacks came under the most fire and moved the furthest obviously this mission was pretty short was fairly easy uh to be fair the mission rating going into it was rated as easy and again we're on the default difficulty so i don't expect things to go that well in the future Uh, I'd also encourage you to to take note of how these soldiers just walked out of that plane. Um, it's important because in the next mission that I show you, I'd like you to compare and contrast the way that the soldiers walk out. And uh, I won't spoil it for you, but it's it's pretty. It's just a cool, subtle uh, technique that they've employed to make that a little bit more of an engaging uh, return home. So we're looking at the items that we've recovered out on the battlefield right now. And uh, these are just different supplies that we're going to be able to use, I assume, in research projects and in other um, expenditures. We've got a Viper Autopsy unlocked. And uh, I think it would be cool if we just Another listened to the spokesman here. My expectations were high, and yet you have exceeded them. I'm glad that we've made the spokesman happy. Uh, I can't expect it to always go that well, but I'm happy that it did. Now this is pretty close to the end of the uh, first video that I'm going to show you guys, and uh, I'm kind of going to wrap up with just some small amount of uh, soldier customization. Uh, one thing before I get into that, you'll notice we're at low supplies. Uh, supplies are essentially the new currency. You've done a uh, it's not money, it's not credits, it's supplies. It's all we've got. 
And I know the aliens aren't happy about losing one of their own. I doubt they thought anyone could get this heap airborne again. I'm more than happy to prove them wrong. There is one thing that I'd like to highlight in the uh, character customization that I'm about to embark on. And that's talking about uh, the lack of mechs in XCOM 2. So there was a lot of speculation like five or six months ago about uh, why we may or may not see some mechs. And it's interesting because you can see that we're actually able to equip something called an exosuit. And funny thing is, I was browsing Reddit recently, and a Reddit user named Nano Paladin uh, actually made like a seemingly insignificant comment in a thread discussing why mechs were not part of XCOM 2. And the comment reads as such: Alternatively, maybe some exoskeletal armor is more budget friendly. And this is in response to the discussion about how it wouldn't make sense that XCOM could even afford mechs in this world. So, uh, well done, Nano Paladin, whoever you are. Uh, you're definitely getting a nod of approval from Corporal Marquez here. With that, I just want to say thank you guys very much for checking out this video. And uh, stay tuned, there will be multiple XCOM 2 videos coming up very, very soon. So, uh, I know I don't ask this a lot, but if you're new to the channel, uh, please consider subscribing. If you guys like the video, uh, please leave a like. It'll help me out a lot. And uh, with that, I'll just leave you the very end of some soldier customization here. And remember, I'll be going into a lot more depth of this soldier customization in a coming video. See you guys soon. I hope you're as excited about XCOM 2 as I am. I cannot wait for February. See you guys next time. The world you once knew is no more. Earth is now ruled by the Advent Coalition and their alien masters. For decades, we have operated in the shadows. Now that we have recovered our greatest weapon, the time has come to reclaim our world. You must wage war on the enemy from your new mobile command center. This commandeered alien vessel will serve as your new base of operations. Though we have acquired new weaponry and operatives, the battlefield is more dangerous. The enemy has grown far more deadly. Must rebuild the XCOM project, expose the alien's true agenda, and renew humanity's will to fight.